Hi, good afternoon everyone. I'm Tori Hart and I work in the research office and as part of the Future Leaders program here at Autism CRC. Um, I'm going to be your host today for our webinar, which is the third in our Autism Month webinar series. We're holding four webinars this Autism Month to improve understanding about autism and to share some of our latest research and outcomes across our three programs, early years, school years and adulthood. We had our early years and adulthood webinars last week and tomorrow's webinar is going to focus on the school years. Um, but today we, you have a chance to hear the perspectives of four autistic adults about what being autistic means to them and what they'd like others to know about autism. Um, before we get started, I just want to let you know that you've got the opportunity to submit text questions by typing your questions into the question pane on the side of the GoToWebinar control panel. This should be appearing on the right hand side of your screen. You can send in questions at any time during the presentation and we'll collect them and address as many as we can during our Q&A session um, at the end of today's presentation. Um, on to today's topic, Autism CRC's vision is to see autistic people empowered to discover and use their diverse strengths and interests. And to help this, mainstream society needs to have a good understanding and acceptance of autism and autistic people and how everybody can help create a world where autistic people can thrive and contribute. With this in mind, I'd like to introduce you to four of our graduates from last year's Future Leaders Program. Amanda Porter, Hayley Clapham, Coletta Abianak, and Liam Dowhall. And I'll let each of you introduce yourself a little bit more to our viewers now. Starting with Amanda. Hi everyone, so I'm Amanda. Um, I was diagnosed at 28 and currently 34. I've also been incredibly blessed with um, two sons. Um, my oldest son was diagnosed at four and um, we're in the process of getting our youngest son who is two um, diagnosed at the moment. Hayley? Um, I'm Hayley, uh, 29 from Sydney. Um, I was diagnosed when I was 27. Um, I have two autistic children, a 10 year old and a six year old. Um, my husband's also autistic. Um, and I'm very, I guess the journey or, you know, our family has what's, uh, I guess inspired me to become a disability uh, and autism uh, advocate. So. Cool, thanks Haley. Cool. Hi, I'm Coletta. Um, I was diagnosed in 2012, um, um, but it wasn't until I think 2014 that I realised that I am autistic. Um, so I was in my 30s, early 30s, um, uh, and I'm a writer and a blogger and um, I've got podcasts and stuff. Oh, and Liam? Hi, um, I'm Liam, I'm 28 years old, and I was diagnosed with autism at the age of 10 and a half. I've been working part-time as an admin assistant for seven years. Um, my sister and I bought a block of land two years ago and just had a house built with two wings. That way I can live independently but still enjoy her company and support. All right. Thanks everyone and now that everyone's introduced uh, themselves we're going to jump into our first question which is what does being autistic mean to you and we're going to start with Carletta. Hi, um, so for me being autistic is um, a kind of supplementary to my identity because I was diagnosed so late. Um, I'd already, um, you know, had a different, done quite a lot with my life and I had various levels of um, knowing who I am. Um, and so it's supplementary to me, but it doesn't mean that it's like a, you know, a handbag that I can put down. It's, it's as um, important 
and um, it's as important as my heart. You know, I can't take my heart out and expect to survive. So that's what I mean. I just mean I don't get everything in my identity from being autistic. Um, so, so what I do have um, from, I don't know if it's from being autistic or from um, uh, the experiences I've had, um, is uh, I'm, I'm quite independent. Like I live on my own at the moment and I love it. Um, it's my third unit that I've lived on my own. Um, I, you know, I do uh, projects and things that no one knows about or expects me to do or expects me to finish. Um, so, for example, in my early 20s, I produced um, uh, two issues of a street magazine, actually three issues plus another issue that never got published. So, um, you know, um, and, you know, writing more books in my 30s, that was no one expected me to do that. Um, and other things that autis autism brings to me is, of course, the attention to detail. So I love um, business planning and, you know, not only just imagining how I would operate and run in a business and imagining all the different roles of a business. Um, you know, so what the customer service person may experience, um, plus what the HR person might experience, plus what the general manager might experience. Um, so there's there's imagination there, but there's also really detailed oriented. So I love creating business plans and um, there, yeah, so that's fun. Um, and also love using attention to detail in my, um, uh, in my workshop designs that I've done um, and I don't know <laughs> um, and writing of course so thanks is there anything else you'd like to hear we will now move to Liam to answer the same question okay uh, to me being autistic means you see the world differently to others uh, that could be a good thing for instance, I notice detail and have a very good memory. That's probably why I'm so good at computers. I have high heightened perception, which means I have acute hearing, taste, and smell. I have perfect pitch, which always made me popular in choirs. I am honest, and, and I think it comes from being literal. Because I'm happy with, with because I'm happy with my own company, I don't need constant socialising. But being autistic does have its disadvantages. My attention to detail sometimes means that I can't see the bigger picture. For example, I have difficulties with flexibility because I am so focused on the planned schedule. Having heightened perception can also be a bad thing. For instance, I have difficulties going to nightclubs and pubs with live music because it's too loud. My heightened sense of taste limits the range of food I can eat. There's a nuisance because I like to travel, but I have problems finding food that I like. Sensitivity to heat means I have difficulty handling food and beverages such as tea. Being literal can also have a disadvantage. For example, people have said, don't worry, everyone's in the same boat, you'll be thinking of an actual boat. Probably the biggest disadvantage is being social. I have difficulties with, with talking to, to people who have never met. I have difficulties making friends. I have difficulties making small talk. I can talk about important stuff like politics, Brexit, the fire in Notre Dame, and most of all, the AFL. I have no idea how to start a conversation with small talk. Thanks for that, Liam. Uh, we're now going to move to our next question, which is what advice do you have for people involved in diagnosing autism? And first, we're going to go to Amanda for this one. Hey, um, my story has been a little bit different. So I was uh, first met a psychologist when I was 14 and I was completely missed. Uh, and I put this down to being a female. 
So I think my advice to our specialists would be um, doing exactly what they're doing now, like listening to these sort of webinars, listening to autistic voices, uh, listening to uh, different people that are autistic and what their experiences are. Um, my actual diagnosis process when I was 28 um, was quite ended up being quite easy. I already had a relationship um, with my psychologist. So for me, that I think supported me um, through that because I already had that, I guess, social relationship with her. Now that we're going through it now um, with my youngest son, one of the advice that I really do want to give to specialists is start steering away from the stereotypical view of what autism is. As soon as we walk into a room, the first thing I hear is, oh, he can't be autistic, he makes eye contact. And so I think, you know, there's so much research out there now which is steering, you know, steering away from, sorry, I'll start again. Sorry, there's so many different aspects to autism out there given that it is a spectrum and we're all different. So looking at looking at different um, areas of it. So even if they do make eye contact, um, they could be still aut autistic or could not be. So looking at, looking at it from all different um, angles. Um, with it and my biggest advice is listen to the parents and carers like we are their number one supporter we are with them every single day not just within that hour or two hours that a specialist um, sees them so have respect for the parent and carer to um, see where they're coming from and what they notice in day-to-day -day life as well yeah thanks for that Amanda and Hayley did you want to share your thoughts yeah okay so um, I've been through the diagnostic process four times. So myself, my two children, and I supported my husband through his. Um, overall, we had a pretty good experience, but there was a big difference between uh, how myself and my husband were diagnosed as opposed to uh, my children. So, I mean, we had, we had good experiences, but I found that um, in regards to after you know what happens after the diagnostic process is uh, very different and the experience that myself and my husband had was quite positive but that's not across the board for autistic adults so when myself and my husband were diagnosed we were offered marriage support we were offered support to kind of unpack the whole diagnosis what it meant for us we were offered yeah like it was it was great you know like and generally what happens is when children are diagnosed you know the parents are given a you know stack of paperwork of support groups and recommended reading and early intervention clinics and but typically when adults are diagnosed it's um oh here's your you know your bit of paper and if you're lucky it's detailed enough that will enable them to get access to the ndis but a lot of the time there's no support afterwards and i think it's it's really important to remember that there is a need for that support because typically the reason an adult seeks a diagnosis is because they're not coping. They're not generally just seeking it for something to do. They're struggling, they need an answer, they want help. And sometimes that label is not enough. Sometimes they need support to unpack what that label means. What does that mean for future job prospects? What does that mean for relationships? Does that mean I could ever become a parent? you know, issues around disclosure, you know, all the negative stuff that accompanies that label, how to deal with stereotypes, how to deal with ableism, internalised ableism, how a lot of the time autistic people that are diagnosed later in life have had traumatic childhoods, you know, abuse, trauma, violence, getting that label sometimes isn't enough to make all that okay. And a lot of that trauma stems from being undiagnosed and unsupported. So I guess, because we had such good support after myself and my husband were diagnosed, I would kind of like promote that for diagnosticians, especially psychologists, to offer that. Don't just give them the diagnosis and then leave it at that. Offer it. Some people might just want a couple of follow-up sessions. Other people might need intensive therapy in order to make sense of it because there's for some, yeah, that label is enough. Others, it's not enough. There's a lot of unlearning that needs to happen. How to learn to be autistic, you know, after years, decades of trying to be neurotypical and hiding who you are, you have to unlearn all of that. You have to move away from all those dysfunctional coping strategies and rather than learning, to, rather than surviving, learn to thrive. 
and other people need support for that. And it's not that's not happening for adults. It's happening for children, but not for adults. And I think that's that's the advice that I would give. Offer support afterwards. Thanks for that, Haley. A lot of uh, really good points there. Um, our next question is about ways that teachers could have better supported you when you were a child. And we're first going to go to Liam with this one. Okay. Uh, well, one thing that teachers could have done was to believe me and my parents. My parents and I worked really hard when I was a child to overcome the effects of my autism. I did lots of speech therapy, occupational therapy, and reading programs. That meant that in school, the effects of autism weren't immediately obvious. However, I still had difficulty following oral instructions, planning a sequence of tasks, and concentrating in class. Some teachers would accommodate this by giving me written instructions and allowing me extra time. They would often ask my parents for advice about how to help me. For those teachers, I would often come top or near the top of the class. This was great for my self-esteem and I worked extra hard. Other teachers refused to believe that I had autism because I said that I wasn't like other autistic children they'd met. They would yell at me for, for daydreaming or for being disorganized. They also refused to provide the accommodations that my parents requested. In one meeting, a teacher actually said, there's nothing wrong with Liam except his parents. My written work was often much better than my older work, but my teachers would sometimes think that I cheated. So for me, it would have made a huge difference if all of my teachers had taken my parents seriously. Each child, each, sorry, each child with autism is going to need different things and the parents are the experts on their own child. Thanks, Liam. And we'll get Hayley to answer this one as well. Okay, so I wasn't diagnosed um, when I was at school um, and I was seen as the uh, the problem child, the, the too difficult, the, um, yeah, there was, there, I, I didn't receive help because they didn't know what um, to do with me and ultimately the school gave up on me and I dropped out uh, in year nine. And so I guess one way that the teachers probably could have better supported me, regardless of whether I had a diagnosis or not, is realise that all behaviour is communication. So, it, I mean, I think it's like 60% of communication is done non-verbally. So, you know, and all autistic students at times will display behaviours that teachers perceive as being challenging, you know, such as showing up late to class, not wanting to participate in an activity or by breaking school rules or questioning authority, the teacher. So I think it's important that teachers understand that when a child's acting up, that that behaviour is not done deliberately to disrupt the classroom or to annoy the teacher, but it's coming from a place of having an unmet need and or being unable to communicate their needs. So rather than labelling them as a delinquent or slow or lazy, try to actually work with the child to discover the messages underneath the behaviour so then they can lead them, the child, to having their needs met. Because what happens in classrooms a lot of the time is that children that have support needs, they are unmet. And so what happens is what's called the spiral of negativity. It's a term coined... Um, to describe the attitudes and approaches of support workers and staff uh, in rehabilitation clinics for the uh, individuals with drug and alcohol uh, abuse issues. And so what happens is that a student has, and this is seen across all institutional uh, settings, such as even educational. So in the case of a, um, in educational setting, a student has an unmet need and tries to convey this through behaviour. The teacher doesn't have the knowledge, skills or understanding to interpret this correctly and sees the child's behaviour as difficult or aggressive. They attempt to change the behaviour and when this fails, the child is perceived as unmotivated, lazy, manipulative, problematic. So the teacher may then start behaving negatively towards child. So 
they might tell colleagues that the child you know is a problem child or they just might avoid contact with the child the teacher doesn't try to intervene any further because the child is now deemed to be the problem not the behavior anymore the teacher tries to cope or deal with the situation by imposing punishments on the child these punishments fail and the behaviors escalate as the child's stress increases and they remain unsupported and their needs not met teachers grow increasingly unable to cope punishments escalate the student's behavior escalates eventually the child's deemed incompatible with the school and expelled or a transfer is requested now that was my experience i was i had unmet support needs I was deemed problematic, my behaviour was problematic, the school eventually gave up on me and they pretty much gave me the choice, you can be here or not, we're not interested, we're not going to help you. So I just pretty much did whatever I wanted to do. I, I went to school, I didn't go to school. I left class, I didn't go to class. I, I, had, I had nothing. And so I just really think that it's important that they realise that the behaviour is communication, not just to ensure the children's needs are met, but also to reduce the long-term devastating effects that those harmful labels have on developing children. When their identities are developing, their sense of self and worth is developing. The language used to describe an individual or their disability is a critical factor in how the individual is perceived by others. Language creates and reinforces stereotypes, alienates, humiliates or reinforces bias towards an individual due to its ability to shape and reflect our beliefs and feelings. So when a child is labelled as dumb, lazy, difficult, useless, those words do have an impact and they shape the way that the child will think about themselves. They do affect things such as self-esteem, confidence, mental health, personal values and beliefs. So I guess I just would like teachers to be aware that when they're, they have students that are presenting with challenging behaviours, look beyond the behaviour, look what is behind, try to find out what is behind that behaviour and please avoid labelling them because they are harmful. And I was called all sorts of horrible names in high school and some of those names still stick with me now. And no child should be called those kinds of names. That's, yeah, so that's my, yeah. Thanks, Hayley. Um, our next question is, how do you think that autistic adults can contribute as role models or sources of support or insight for younger people on the spectrum and their families? And the first person to answer this one is going to be Carletta. Um, oh, can't hear you. Can't hear, there, there you are. Okay. <clears throat> um, Okay, so um, what I what I would like to see is for parents who just um, received a diagnosis, or, or you know, whenever whenever someone, whether it's a child of a teenager or a newborn, whatever, um, if they can meet a group of autistic adults, especially the minimum. Females has to be fifty percent, um, because um, and um, so you can see that we've had various uh, careers. Um, for myself, I had to stop working quite a while ago. Um, I had autistic burnout. Um, uh, uh, let me see. Um, you can see that we don't have a certain look and that we can talk differently. Um, like, for instance, you just saw me stutter. Um, I do that sometimes, and I was doing it earlier today, but I'm also um, very articulate. So uh, it's, it's, it's not a – so it would be great if parents could know, and, and the children that maybe – but definitely the parents that – we're not, um, uh, you know, we're not, we're not all going to end up, um, I don't know how to describe it. We, we can have productive lives, our own individualities and our own um, skills and strengths. And it's great to see that and to hear parents talk to each other about that, but to actually see it for yourself 
and hear it for yourself is a totally another thing. Like when I met these um, autistic people here, like Liam, Amanda and Hayley, um, it was amazing that like the amount of uh, things that I'd assumed about autistic people, um, it, it um, yeah. So if the parents could meet the children uh, in autistic adults, that'd be great. Um, uh, as role models, I'm, I'm not sure about that, actually, other than perhaps um, we can help the kids do their homework in a way that's actually interesting to them so they'll finish their homework or they'll get quite a bit through it instead of just abandoning it after, you know, two minutes or ten minutes like I used to do. Um, we could um, help them with uh, learn to live independently as young children. So my um, mother had a hard time looking after us because she's autistic and she only found out recently. Um, and so us kids learned how to cook when we were about, I don't know, 11 maybe, like still grade six, grade seven. Um, um, so cooking skills, especially food preparation and freezing meals um, is really useful. It's something I discovered recently is to chop lots of veggies, put them in bags, chuck them in the fridge, excess in freezer, and then um, whenever I want to cook, whatever I want to cook, I can cook it then. Um, we can let them know what the rental process involves um, uh, when we move out of home and go into share houses. So for instance, I had no idea um, that um, what bond was. I knew it was a word and I knew it involved money. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know, um, you know, um, that I had to inspect the houses and go into an interview, you know, sign the paperwork, um, you know, just the whole process of step by step what's actually involved with moving into your own home. Um, and of course, with share houses, um, I guess I don't, it's a lot to ask, but if there's a way that we could help your teenagers be a bit more responsible at home, I don't know if there's a way, maybe maybe the parents could answer this, but um, and, and help with budgeting. I think um, I still have a lot of problems with impulse control and um, mood management and um, uh, trying to relax. I've, I've got um, out of control anxiety quite often uh, and I'm agoraphobic. Um, so, uh, so for me, uh, w one thing that would have helped if I had a mentor was to help me um, manage my emotions, I guess. Thanks for that, Carletta. Amanda? Uh, this is a topic that I'm actually incredibly um, passionate passionate about and what I base um, my my role and I guess my purpose and what I see, why, what I was actually put on the planet for and that's to inspire and educate others and I was incredibly fortunate that when I got my diagnosis I was already running um, a blog through Facebook called Autism Toolbox where I was supporting um, families and um, talking about what it's like to raise a child um, with autism and also from an education point of view so I already had that platform there for me to, I guess, talk about my journey as being um, an autistic um, female. And um, I would love to be role models for other other parents out there because I think a lot of still, still a lot of specialists out there start off with, I'm sorry, your child has a diagnosis of da 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 da. So straight away, parents, parents feel like there's this negative um, link to autism and their child's life. But, you know, I want to show people that, you know, anything is anything is possible. Um, I mean, I know I was diagnosed later in life, but, um, you know, I've achieved a lot um, in my short time, short time here, so 34 years and got four degrees in education. Uh, I'm in a relationship. I'm raising two children, um, running a household, running businesses. You know, anything anything is possible and not to let, you know, I guess the diagnosis um, stop me, but using my gifts that autism has given me to 
to achieve everything that I've achieved in life. And I don't, and I do honestly believe that if I wasn't autistic, I don't think I would have managed um, being a single mum and studying full time, working full time, and being able to manage, you know, so many different um, aspects of life that you know other people might have got overwhelmed with. I mean, that's just my that's just from my journey alone and I often do say that you know I can only speak on behalf of myself because everybody is different and I think being a role model to um, other female uh, other female autistics um, out there and you know of course in um, in society everywhere in the autism community especially you know we do have we do have different female male non-binary um, gender fluid etc but I, I'm only speaking on behalf of myself which is an autistic um, female and I'd love to be role model for all the young girls that are coming through to show them you know that anything is still possible they can live on their own they can have children they can um, get married if that is what they um, choose to do um, in life they can go to uni they can finish school like just you know that you know anything is possible and use the gifts that autism has given you to to achieve that one of the things that I'm awesome at is being able to focus on one or two things at once so I know when I set myself a goal I know that I'm you know quite capable to achieve that goal because I I face that goal with such um, adversity and passion and I just do everything I can to achieve that goal and I think that's my ultra focus attitude of um, being autistic um, and I do want to show the world that you know that anything anything is possible and that's something that I do um, through my blog and I think you know we're in a really fortunate position where you know people people get to listen to us because we are the autistic voices this is something that we face every single day we're not just reading it from a textbook and pretending to be experts in our field like this is something that we do every day and when I was coming back from Brisbane um, after um, after our day after our day there I um, was going into meltdown mode and I actually had internet on the plane and I posted on my page and actually posted exactly how I was feeling how my body how my body felt how my brain felt everything and I had so many parents jumping on and commenting and and saying oh you know thank you so much for sharing that it's so great to actually understand um, what my child is feeling so then I can better understand them so then they understand that you know meltdown is not a choice it's not to gain attention it's not to um it's you know it's not there to um to gain something it's it's for us to it's for us to um support ourselves and re-regulate um, our own body and just for me describing in a couple of paragraphs uh, what it actually felt for me I reached a lot of people to being able to then support um, themselves or their child as well. Thanks for that Amanda. Um, our next question is if you could change one thing about how society perceives or responds to autistic people what would it be and we are going to go to Liam on this one. Okay. Um, if I could change one thing, it would be to ensure that people in authority have a sound knowledge and training about being autism friendly. This would include police, security guards, transport guards, prison staff and school staff. I've known a number of examples where autistic people have become distressed by interacting with an authority member and this has made the situation worse. For example, a friend of mine had a bad experience at an airport. He became distressed by the intrusive behaviour of the security staff. His anxiety escalated, which made the security staff suspicious. And then other cases where a routine check by police has resulted in anxiety and further escalation. Training how to de-escalate tense situations would prevent misunderstanding with authority. Uh, my father witnessed an autistic man get distressed because he wanted to take his bike on the train before nine o'clock, but the transport guards wouldn't let him. If the transport guards had a better understanding of autistic people, they probably would have resolved the situation in a less forceful way. For example, they could have told him it's fine at this time, but in future don't do it before nine o'clock. Autistic people can get into trouble with authority figures because of their honest and literal answers to questions. 
For example, a teacher asks your students in a playground, can you pick up the piece of rubbish? And the student says yes and walks away. In this case, it could be an after school detention, but the results could be worse if it was a police officer or a security officer. In conclusion, I think that training for people in authority for the critical issues with autism could make a huge difference. Thank you for that, Liam. And Carletta, what's one thing you'd like to change? Um, there's so many. So, um, look, my favourite blog post at the moment that I've written, and it's a podcast as well, is um, called Getting Used to Places. So, and it's about um, just, you know, like... Um, taking time before um, just letting us um, sit in silence and get used to the sights and sounds and smells and the patterns of um, um, of what's happening in the supermarkets, things like that. Uh, you know, if we need um, five seconds to answer a question, um, you know, don't interrupt and I'm I'm so bad at this I interrupt people all the time but um, um, yeah so that's one thing um, yeah and and it basically appreciate us because you know we um, who we are if if you see us at our worst then I think we equally that amazing at our best, you know what I mean? Like the intensity. So I appreciate us. Yep, definitely important. Um, the last one of our pre-prepared questions is what is your favourite part about being autistic? And first we're going to go to Hayley on this one. Uh, my favourite part about being autistic was finding out that I was autistic. Um, prior to finding out that I was autistic, I struggled um, with my sense of self, my identity, um, self-worth, all of those um, things. I didn't like myself. Um, I didn't like my brain. I didn't like the way I thought. I didn't like any of that because I couldn't understand why everyone else had it so easy and why I was struggling so much and I just thought it was me that I was the, I was the problem. Um, so being given that answer, you know, that label, brought with it such an understanding that I'm not actually defective, um, I'm autistic. And it was kind of like receiving permission to, you know, drop the act, stop pretending to be something that I'm not, and to learn to reach out and ask for help. Um, because at the time of my diagnosis, I was barely uh, surviving. I was, I had no idea who I was. I had, I was, you know, so detached from who I really was because I was trying to make it as everyone else. I was trying to be everyone else. I was trying to fit in. I was trying to copy. I was, I had just, ultimately lost myself and so discovering that I was autistic was life-changing because suddenly I found out I was a person I, I had an identity I I belonged I I had this tribe where there was others like me there was um you know I it was freeing I could I could come out from hiding I could expose who I was um the, the me that was you know forced into hiding due to rejection fear confusion and that person was lost under all of that masking and so yes that's that's my favorite part of being autistic was finding out that i was because i i'd been um an incredibly life-changing journey um finding out that i was and it helped me learn to move from that that sort of negative space of how I perceive myself to now embracing who I am and embracing my brain and how I work. Um, that I am, you know, accepting I'm complex, I'm highly sensitive, and using to work with that as opposed to working against it, which is what I was doing before. So that's, yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you for that, Hayley. Um, Amanda, what's your favourite part? Uh, I think I'm very similar to Hayley. I think um, finally having that understanding and appreciation of how my brain works um, when I finally got the piece of paper to say, yes, you are autistic. Um, I think following on that was, um, I think my whole understanding of my whole entire life just sort of came together. You know, why certain aspects of my childhood, like just everything, everything made sense. And, but with that, with the label also came to that, um, I guess, appreciation of myself and what I'm capable of and um, also understanding what I'm not capable of. So, and giving myself permission to have a meltdown and to actually admit that I'm not coping with the situation. So, um, so before I was diagnosed, I walked into a shopping centre and um, I had a massive meltdown because the whole entire shopping centre um, had changed, the lighting, the smell, the music, like everything had changed and I had to walk out and I had to leave and I got really angry at myself because I'm like, you know, what 26-year-old walks out of a toy shop having a meltdown because it changed but then you know two years later you know that that whole thing made sense because you know I don't like change of routine I don't like change and you know what that is actually that's actually okay and if I walk into a social situation where it's too loud and I can't understand or I can't hear people then then that's okay too I think one of my biggest favourite things about finding out that I am autistic is that I finally belong I finally belong to a tribe and um, I loved being part of the Future Leaders where I got to actually walk into a room where, you know, there was so many other people that was like that was like me. I got to fiddle. I got to – I hand stim a lot. And there was, there was no judgment. There was no – like, you know, I probably looked around. There was probably three other people that were hand, that were hand stimming um, as well. And I meet up with my girlfriends now who are also diagnosed autistic and we get to compare, you know, all our sensory sensory toys that, you know, we have found and go, oh, Phil has soft pieces, oh, that's really nice. And, you know, we um, we have that amazing and deep conversation where we get to actually talk about our day-to-day -day struggles and, and also the strengths and the positiveness on our day-to-day -day life. And we get to talk about that and go, oh, my gosh, me too. And just having somebody there that actually has that um, same understanding and same, I guess, look on what life actually is about. Um, I mean, autism is a part of us. I can't imagine. I can't imagine life without it now. And I mean, it's part of me. So it's not really something that I can actually say. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how different life would have been without without being autistic because it is, you know, it's a part of me and. You know, we're a very out and proud autistic um, family. Like, you know, we, we love it. We, we love how our brain works. We love that, you know, when we find something that we love and adore, that, that all we do is, you know, talk about it and, you know, um, learn every single different aspect of it that we, that we can. Um, when I was younger, one of my special interests and passions was football. And in, in South Australia, we've got our um, sand pool. And I could tell you every single player um, that was on there. I could tell you their num their number, their their football team, their birth date, their weight. Um, I could tell you every single statistic to the point that I actually got to um, go onto a radio show at the age of 15 and commentate commentate a game. I mean, what other 15 year olds have actually had that um, opportunity and experience to um, do that? And I've just had so many opportunities and experience come up. Um, because I am autistic, and you know, for that I, for that I'm forever grateful for what um, what autism has actually um, brought into my life. And the the biggest thing is is finding my tribe and and who I am. All right, thank you, everyone, uh, Amanda, Haley, Carletta, and Liam for sharing your experiences and insights. Uh, we've now got about 15 minutes to go through some of the questions that our viewers have been sending in. Um, this first one is from a parent of an eight-year-old who was diagnosed a few years ago, and they haven't shared the diagnosis with the child's school or with the child, and they're wanting to know someone's thoughts on the pros and cons of disclosing the diagnosis. Hayley, would you like to answer this one? Um, definitely disclose. That's, um, so I'm currently, in a similar situation with my eldest son at um, school. Now he's out loud and proud. Um, from the moment he was diagnosed, he was four. Um, I told him 
he's always been a part of the diagnosis process. He's well aware that that's um, an inherent part of him. He's in a support class. There's three other support classes. He's the only child out of all of them that knows that they're autistic. Now that poses a problem because he's looking for support. He's looking for support from his peers. He's wanting to talk to them, but they don't know that they are. Now, there's one particular child that he's now resorting to Googling what is autism because he's overheard teachers talking about autism. So he doesn't know what it is, he doesn't understand it. He's Googling. Now that's harmful because what is currently online in regards to what autism is, no child wants to see that. No child should be exposed to that kind of negativity, that the medical model, the, the stereotypes, all of that harmful stuff. The, I guess the child should be part of it because it is an inherent part of who they are. You should not hide that from them because a time is going to come when they realise I'm different, I'm not like my peers and they're going to want support, they're going to want to talk to others about it, they're going to have questions but if you keep it hidden from them that's when they're really going to struggle with identity and they're really going to struggle with not knowing who they are because they've got all this stuff going on in their head but they don't have an answer why and to me that's it's cruel. I, I I would say please tell them because that's you're going to lead them on. That's going to be the first step on a positive path to positive identity. It's it is an inherent part of who they are, and that that label is so important and so so crucial to be aware of. Like it. Um, yeah, it, it is the key, and it's the key to your child finding their tribe and finding your tribe, you know, connecting with other autistic people is so important. It is, that's been one of the biggest blessings for me was finding others like me, but without knowing that they are autistic, they're not going to have access to that. And that is such a huge uh, support for them. So, yes, I think definitely tell your child. Um, Obviously, you know, because if you don't, someone else is going to either the internet or, and you, yes, you don't want the internet telling your child. You don't want a child Googling what is autism because that's what, what's out there is not, um, that's not very positive, unfortunately. So, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that, Hayley. Um, our, Next question is actually, um, what do you do to relax? And Liam, would you like to answer this one? Well, <laughs> um, well, to relax, um, I often play uh, some video games. Um, I often watch some films uh, as well. Um, I often like to go for walks. Um, and that's about it, really. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, another question that we've got is asking about friendship and how people go with making and maintaining friends. Um, Amanda, did you want to answer this one? I just, um, yeah, sorry, just unmuting. Um, yeah, I think. I think definitely finding out who you are to the core, so not just not just being autistic or not autistic. I think looking at um, what your values are as well, I think is definitely a key component um, to finding and maintaining uh, friendships as well. So a lot of my friends are autistic, but they're also um, family people as well because family is my uh, top values. I think also finding out how um, how your mode of communication is too, and what you feel comfortable with. So my uh, my best friend she doesn't like she doesn't like phone calls, and I respect that. So we communicate uh, via messenger on Facebook. Um, we communicate via text messages um, or in person. So asking those questions, what do people actually feel comfortable with, and how do they how would they like to communicate? Um, also, you know, asking the questions, you know, how often would you like to catch up? Some people might only like to communicate via text messages and not actually meet face-to-face -face and, you know, that's okay too. 
I think friendship over the years is something, especially as a child, is something that I did struggle with um, a lot until I started understanding who I am as a person. I had a lot of beautiful friendships and I pushed them away um, because of my own, I guess, mental health in a way. And I always said I didn't have any friends and, you know, I had those for 27, 27 years later, like they they still stuck by, with, uh, by me and they are still my um, beautiful friends today. And I'm so, I'm so grateful for that. And I do belong to quite a few, um, I guess, different social groups um, now. And that's just all come from networking and, and knowing who I am and people knowing who I am as well. So they know that if I'm, that if I'm quiet, um, you know, they, they know it's because I can't actually hear um, what they're saying. I'm quite um, open with how I'm feeling as well. So just having that respect for your friendships as well by saying, you know, I'm really sorry, but I'm not coping in this situation or I'm really sorry I can't actually hear you because of the background noise and then having that mutual respect um, back and that understanding of what it is. And it all comes down to education as well. Like if I don't educate them on, on certain aspects of myself and autism, then, you know, how else are they going to learn? Um, what it is so you know and that same with your spouse in any sort of relationship you need to communicate um, how you're feeling because they're not mind readers they're not gonna they're not gonna know how you're feeling whether or not that's a you know um, in a re intimate relationship family relationship friendship relationship or anything else yeah um, thank you for that Amanda um, and next question is what's something that would have helped you to participate and feel more included at school Paletta, did you want to answer this one? I'm so sorry. Um, I pressed the wrong button. Um, I don't know, but uh, other than if I'd known that I'm autistic, like, because I, I went to, um, I think it was seven schools. Uh, like maybe um, four primary schools, three high schools, every single one of them I was bullied at. And, you know, um, um, so just knowing that I'm autistic, I would, you know, like, and I, I, I used to, um, like, if I'd known, then, um, and I could have found out, Oh, I'll, I'll try again. Um, so the kids used to call me retard quite often. Uh, and I remember an interaction, one interaction in particular, and this girl was saying, you're a retard. And I was like, no, you're a retard. She was like, no, you're a retard. And I was like, no, you're a retard. Because I just thought it was like the worst word that you could call someone. I didn't realise that I... I am autistic, you know what I mean? So um, if I'd have known how to um, learn social skills, like that there were things to learn, I didn't know that there was, um, uh, until I was an adult, until 2014, I thought that body language was um, a literal expression of your body to totally complement your words. I didn't realise that there was, you know, things that I could be communicating and others could be communicating that doesn't come out and speak, you know. So, I mean, you know, that's in my 30s. So if you can imagine how much, even just knowing of the existence of how body language works, um, what are some things to look out for? Like not, you know, specific things, but just context and things I can research, you know. Um, does that and I'm not sure yeah. what else to say. No, that's, yep. no, that's great, Carletta. Okay. Um, our next question is how do you define or describe autism? And Haley, would you like to answer this one? Um, so for me, autism is simply the lens in which I view the world, it colors everything that I do, um, the way I interact with the world. Um, the way I interact with other people, communicate, it is, it is the lens of how I perceive and experience the world. It's, um, it is, it's an inherent part of me and it's, yeah, like it's, um, that, that's pretty much it. Like you can't, if you, if you removed 
the autism, then I, I, I wouldn't be who I am because that does influence everything, every aspect of my life. It, um, yes, that's how I view it. Very good. Um, the, the next question, I think, Liam, we might get you to answer because it's specifically for people that were diagnosed a little bit younger. So we just have someone who's wanting to know what were the most valuable supports and therapies that you received that have really helped you develop into the wonderful adult autistic person that you are now? Uh, uh, right, okay. Um, well, not quite sure how to answer this one. <laughs> Um, well, okay. I suppose the, um, the sort of supports that would help me would probably be more like um, the adjustments. Uh, sorry. Sorry, I can't answer them. Sorry. That's uh, okay. Did, did anyone else have anything that they wanted to add there? I know everyone else was diagnosed and adult, but I know people have kids and so forth that have also gone through the process. So um, I can answer from a mother's point of view, if that if that will help answer the question. So I think the biggest one that has supported um, both my children, so my youngest is currently nonverbal, so speech therapy um, has definitely played a huge part. Um, for my oldest son, um, occupational therapy has been incredible um, and um, going from being able to, so he'll get one drop of water on him and have to strip off to nothing, um, to being able to play football in the rain um, now. So I think um, sensory regulation, I think, has been a huge thing because it's not changing, it's not changing who he is. It's not, it's not making him conform to um, society standards. It's supporting him in um, sensory regulation to support him to um, be able to cope. Um, in the outside, in the outside world, and and it's really supported him within within schooling, going from not being able to sit still for thirty seconds to um, just missing out on a scholarship to one of the top schools in South Australia um, as well. So, and I think psychology uh, supported me as well, being able to come up with strategies within the household on how to support him, and then him being able to uh, speak to somebody about how he's feeling so he can process his thoughts and his feelings towards being autistic. So, not just so he could talk to a professional about that. So, not just talking to his mother. Um, about how he's feeling, being able to talk to a, um, a professional with coming up with strategies on how he can cope and how he can manage how he is feeling. Thanks, Amanda. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Hayley? Yeah, I guess the biggest supports or therapies um, I've found for, I guess, not just my children, um, but myself and my husband is acceptance and understanding that has been the, the biggest the biggest help overall because without that you have no access to appropriate supports so you know everything that we have done you know occupational therapy or you know speech psychology it's all been to support them in who they are. It's all been about supporting them to live as autistics in a neurotypical world. It's never ever been about changing them or making them conform or none of that. So I guess the best advice is when you're trying to look for ways to help your child, look at something that is going to honor who they are and that comes from a basis of wanting to understand them uh, accept them and work with them to thrive as themselves, not not as pretend neurotypicals. I guess that's that's always been the um, the biggest thing. And also in regards to these therapy and supports, include the child. You know, not just the the therapy. You know, the psychologist. Um, you know, talking over the child to the parent, but include the child in it. Include you know, let the child direct the sessions let the child say what is what's happening at school let because that teaches self-advocacy because one day our kids aren't going to have us they need to be able to advocate for themselves and if we are constantly filtering them or talking over them and saying this is what's wrong this is what they need that's 
that's not going to help them. They need to be able to say, this is what I need. I'm struggling with this. And so that's, yeah, that's my advice. <laughs> yep. Thanks for that, Hayley. Now we're out of time, but I know that Carletta, you had your hand up before. So did you just quickly want to add to that? Yes. So I stopped speaking, um, I think it was between uh, four years old until um, six years old. So grade one. I, so it was and the advice that the um, person gave mum was tell her to say one thing. So she wants a glass of water, just try to get her to say water or apple. So just say one thing and, and don't expect them to say it, but try to, you know. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thanks for that, Carletta. Now, b before we go, Liam, was there anything else that you'd thought of while everyone else was talking or any other advice that you just wanted to give to professionals before we wrap up? Um, no, I think that's about it, actually. Yep, that, that's okay. Just wanted to make sure that you, were, that you had another opportunity. Um, so thanks again, Amanda, Hayley, Carletta and Liam for sharing your experiences and insights with us. I'd also like to thank all of our viewers for joining us today and sending in questions. Um, I hope that you've found this webinar to be informative and insightful. Um, if you'd like to be able to share today's webinar, we'll be placing a recording of the session on our YouTube channel and we'll share this through our website and social media channels, most likely in the next week. Um, and if